And thank you everyone for taking the time to be here today. Giving webcasts is one of my favorite ways to share tips about Office, and it's been a while since I've had the opportunity to do this, so I've really been looking forward to this session. As you might already know, um, today's session is the first in a series I'm going to be giving over the next few months. And today I'm going to take you through some tips to help you simplify your work when using Word, PowerPoint, and Excel to create content. The session is a bit of an overview, so we're going to cover a lot of ground, hopefully give you some tips that can help save you time, help you create better content, just introduce some features that you might want to learn more about later. In the months to come, I'm going to be doing individual sessions on Word, PowerPoint, and Excel that will go a bit deeper into each of those applications, as well as a session that will introduce Office extensibility as well. I'll tell you all about those or a little bit more about those before we leave today. But for now, we've got a lot, a lot of ground to cover for today's session, and I can tell you from experience that the time goes by really quickly. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, before jumping in, I just want to give you a brief idea of what to expect today. Well, like my books, this webcast is not really intended for beginners. To that end, I'm going to be making some assumptions about your office experience during this session, and you can get an idea about the type of assumptions I mean from the examples on this slide. But you know what, if any of these tasks aren't familiar to you, even if you are a beginner with Office, please don't be concerned and please do stay. You know, if, you're, if you're quite new to creating content in Office, it might seem like I'm going pretty fast. But keep in mind, as Yaz mentioned, you can ask questions and also this, that this webcast is being recorded. So you're going to be able to come back if you'd like to, fast forward, rewind, review anything of interest to you that you missed. I want to say, in fact, that because this is an overview and we're going to go through a lot of things, it might seem to everyone that I'm, or to a lot of people, that I'm going fairly quickly through things. So just remember that you can ask questions, but I do want to mention that I'm going to answer all questions at the end, so I won't be stopping during the demo to ask, um, answer questions. But I'm also going to be giving you a, um, excuse me, a website where you can go after this session if questions come up later that you can send me an email with your questions as well. So now, even though I've planned the session for users with more experience, it would really help me be able to deliver a, uh, a deliver a session for you that, regardless of your level, is going to be a little bit more helpful and enjoyable. So I want to take just a minute or two of our time here to learn a little bit more about your experience with Office. If you'd help me out and take a couple of quick anonymous polls. So the first one you can see up on your screen. It's coming up right now if you don't see it just yet. And there it is. So how do you rate your own experience skill level creating content using Office? Any recent version of Microsoft Office for Windows or for Mac? And just go ahead and click on the, um, the answer that seems most applicable to you. Really appreciate you just jumping in there and give us your feedback. And we'll give everybody just about a minute to do that. How are we doing on responses there? Um, yeah, should we give people another minute, or should we move on to the next one, do you think? Okay, let's, do you want to see the results? We can sure, sure post those. Um, please, yeah, let's take a look at who's in the room. Remember, these are anonymous, not going to say any names. Okay, super. So it looks like we've got a lot of advanced and intermediate users here. Um, beginners, don't worry. You're going to hopefully find some cool tips and stuff you might want to learn more about. Um, experts, um, I hope you find some interesting tips here as, um, as well and look forward to hearing any that you have to share as well. And so just one more question for you then, folks. Let's see. Well, um, what is, we're going to take a look at just one more poll, and that is what version of Office is your strongest, whether you're a beginner expert or anything in between. And got a, um, for options here, Office 2010, Office 2007, or an earlier version, or if you're a Mac user, Office for Mac 2011, Office 2008 for Mac, or an earlier version of that one.
Cool. Do you think, um, Jeff, can we take a look at the results for this one? Yes, you think we're ready to look at results? We'll get those right up. Just one second. Thanks. So, folks, we're going to get we're going to keep going in just a second, and we'll jump into the demo here. Really appreciate you taking the time to do this. It helps me know what to take your time with today and what not to waste your time on. So, I'm just going to take another second, and we will get going. And here we go. Oh. That was our last one. But I do have to say I'm really glad that, um, that nobody answered um, that experience question with what's Microsoft Office. Um, I, I was sure that there would be at least a couple of people who would do that just for fun. Um, but appreciate you um, answering honestly. Okay, and here we are. Let me kind of up in just a second. So great, it looks like we've got a lot of Office 2010 users um, in the room, people who are already using Office 2010, a lot of people who are on Office 2007, and mostly Windows users, so that's great. It does look like we've got a few Office for Mac users in the room, so if Office for Mac is still your, um, your dominant um, your, your dominant version if you're still working primarily on Mac. Uh, but my, um, my newest book, which I'll tell you a little bit more about before we leave today, is, um, is for both Office 2010 and Office for Mac 2011. Today's session is going to be just in Office 2010. I will try to mention if a feature is or is not applicable. Most features are applicable to both versions. So if Mac users have specific questions on how to get something done, don't hesitate to ask those questions. And I will give you um, I will um, help you be able to ask more questions and give you some resources for more information later as well. All right, so thanks very much, everyone, for taking the time to do that. Let's get down to business. Okay, so today's session, as mentioned, is focused on Office 2010. Um, You've got, if you've got Office 2010, or even for the many users who are still in Office 2007, you know, you've got some very powerful, flexible software that can enable you to create really beautiful content. And you don't have to be an expert to get it done without pain and with pretty great results. But the question is, and the question that we're concerned with today, are you letting Office do the job that you hired it for? You know, chances are, if you're like most users, you, you're using what you know. You're occasionally discovering a new feature, but often doing more work than you have to or wondering if you're doing more work than you have to because you just don't know that there's an easier way. Or a lot of times it just seems faster, right, to just muddle through the way you always have rather than trying to learn something new or figure it out. But my favorite thing about Office is almost always the less work you do, the better your content is going to be. So the fact is when something seems complicated or cumbersome, there's usually an easier way. So we're going to start out the demo today taking a look at a few of my favorite features that work across Word, PowerPoint, and Excel to help you save time and work more easily in the programs. And
Okay. So as far as talking about some cross-program features, examples of cross-program features, there are so many features. You know, one of the nicest things about Office as it grows into new versions, I think, anyway, is how much more you see that you can do in multiple applications. It's, it makes things feel more consistent. It's easy, right? If I know I can do that in Word and I can do it in PowerPoint, I only have to learn it once, right? Sometimes features also work the same feature will give you benefits across programs. And the first one that I mentioned to, want to mention today is one that for people who have either attended events with me in the past or read my, my um, books or other content that, um, that I've published, um, you know, is a, it, this is a pet feature, a very important feature to me in Office, and that is document themes. Themes were introduced in Office 2007. They are a formatting feature. They are a way of applying a lot of formatting very quickly and consistently to a document, a presentation, or a workbook. And then some will talk a little bit about what that is. So what I've got up on screen here, and let's make this a little prettier. I'm going to just go ahead and turn off table grid lines for the moment so you can just see the screen the way it's um, intended to print. This is an example pitch book page in Word. And should um, mention that any of most of the sample documents, in fact, most of the sample documents that I'm going to use during this event are samples from my new book. So if you do have that book, you do have the documents available to you as well. So you can check them out live for yourself. Uh, in um, so though, so basically. A theme, which you find on the page layout tab in Word as well as in Excel and on the design tab in PowerPoint, a theme applies a consistent font, excuse me, a consistent set of fonts, colors, and graphic formatting effects to an entire document with just one click. The beauty is that you can apply the same theme to a document, a presentation, a workbook. One theme works, works across all of these programs. In fact, you can use some elements of themes when in formatting Outlook email messages and other Outlook content and access reports and some other types of um, access content as well. So um, important though to mention for publisher and Visio users, Themes in those applications, even if some of them look or sound the same as Office themes, they're not. They're separate in Office 2010. Um, so Word, PowerPoint, and Excel is where you find the themes. So we have, um, we have themes. So for example, I'm going to go ahead and preview some things, and it may take just a second for those to show up on your screen. But if I point to different themes in the gallery, notice how the document changes. And if you've tried this yourself, you know in real time it works a little bit faster than what you're seeing on your screen share. But you can point to various themes in the gallery to apply different sets of formatting and just click to apply the one you want. So what's the beauty of themes? What's the big deal? Well, every Office 2010, or for that matter, Office 2007 document, has a theme whether you use it or not. In Word and Excel, you can ask the question, do I need it? Do you ever change fonts? Do you use colors at all, like such as for charts and graphics? Uh, do you ever use graphics that would use formatting effects, such as the charts and graphics shown here as well? If the answer to all those questions is no, if you're creating simple text-only documents with no color and you always use the same font, then no, you don't need to worry about themes. In PowerPoint, you always do, because in PowerPoint, the theme also contains the slide master, the set of slide layouts, which are customizable now, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes, and the set of slide background options, the slide background gallery options. Now, those slide background gallery options, another thing that we'll look at a little bit later, are actually available to some content in Word and Excel, and I'll show you that a little later on if you want to take advantage of them. But when it comes to PowerPoint, the theme is the underlying is the underlying thing, right, the underlying structure. Themes are the evolution of what were design templates in older versions. So they're essential there. And they are essential in Word and Excel as well if you're creating complex content. So what's the benefit of them, though? The benefit, there's, there can be multiple different benefits. My favorite is if you're in a company where you need to implement branding well, whether you're in a large company or if you're a one-person company and you want to brand all the content you create, you want it to look consistent. You can create a theme that matches your brand and apply it to all of your content. Yes, there's a little more to it than that. The documents need to be created so that the formatting is theme-aware, but that's, that's 
happens by default in Office 2010 and Office 2012. And it's a lot simpler, a lot simpler than that statement may sound. You can, you can actually, when you create new content, it's going to happen by default. For those folks who are migrating from earlier versions, it's important to know that if you apply themes and nothing changes, that's because the content wasn't created using formatting that recognizes themes. It's the default in new Office 2007 and 2010 documents when you use the new file formats, right? The file formats with, four, with the four character extensions, the Office Open XML file formats, as they're called. If you use a legacy file format like DOC, PPT, the three character extensions, you're not going to have theme-aware content. And if you convert a file up from that, you're going to have to apply theme-aware content in order to get your themes. Okay, we're not going to go into the details of what that is and how to do, and, and how to do it here, but I do have resources that I can send you to to learn all about that. It's um, actually quite easy to do, but just do keep in mind that when you create a new Word, PowerPoint, or Excel document, the content you add is theme aware right away, which means you can just click one of those themes to apply it and change your content right away. Okay, so themes really formatting advanced that can save you a lot of time. And for those folks who may be in charge at a, at a company of implementing your company branding, just think how much easier that can make it for the other users and how much more consistent your content can be. But when it comes to simplifying content creation, you know, we see things like the office graphics, like the smart art graphics shown here, these diagrams and charts, Excel charts, which are now natively available in both Word and PowerPoint as well. One of my favorites is SmartArt Graphics. So I've switched over to PowerPoint here. And take a look at this boring old slide, this boring old slide that shows our organizational structure, right? You're creating a presentation, want to show our organizational structure. But, you know, creating an organization chart, well, it takes some drawing skill, right? And it takes time, and you've got to align things, and they never turn out looking good. And, well, so I'm going to click into this text box that I made and point here and click there and, oh dear, that was hard. Wasn't that hard? That was really hard. You can see, you can kind of get the idea why I like SmartArt. SmartArt, notice that I'm clicking to apply a style, clicking to apply a set of colors. All of these automatically, by default, without you doing any extra work, coordinate with the document theme. So they automatically take on your personal or business brand. Notice how simple that is and how perfect it looks. Well, with SmartArt, I can also then, let's say, the Senior VP of Operations has a third subordinate. I press Enter in this text pane over here, and it creates another shape. And I start typing, and it adds it already formatted. If I demote that, I'm going to press Tab, just like I would to change the level of a bullet in text. And notice what it did. It moved, it moved that shape to be a subordinate of the shape above. So you can literally create and edit a diagram just by typing and editing a bulleted list. Really fantastic stuff. And SmartArt is just one example of a lot of different graphics tools that are available. It's, I, went to some, I went to PowerPoint here because PowerPoint has a few extra shortcuts with SmartArt, like the ability to convert to SmartArt. From, uh, from text, but SmartArt is available, as you saw it live in Word, it's also available in Excel, and you have an enormous number of SmartArt layouts, a wide variety of diagrams, lists, process, cycle diagrams, a huge variety of diagrams, and if you have an OpenXML developer, if you uh, with someone who knows Office OpenXML, SmartArt is extensible. You can create your own custom layouts that match your branding. So, um, so keep that one in mind. But lots of uh, in, lots of great graphics tools that automatically coordinate with the formatting in your documents. But there's also some cool advances. Um, no webcast would be complete without a picture of my kitty cat. Sorry, I just can't resist, folks. Uh, but in Office 2010, there are some really new, fantastic, um, well, both new and improved um, picture editing tools. Those are available across Word, PowerPoint, and Excel as well. And some of the picture tools we're going to look at here, such as the crop tool I'm about to show you, is also available in Publisher. So let's say that you want to change the size. Cropping has not in the past been the easiest or friendliest thing to do in Office, in my opinion. But 
if I need to crop this image, so I turn on the crop tool, and so far, if you've used this in an earlier version, if you've used cropping in an earlier version, it looks about the same. But as I drag to resize that crop area, you're going to see that I'm seeing my entire image in shadow, right? It doesn't actually move my image. Those of you who use PowerPoint, think about this. So you can now use this tool to crop a picture within a placeholder on a slide without moving that placeholder. So you don't have to mess up layout anymore because you can move an image within the crop area. Notice what happens if I just pick up that image and I'm going to drag the image around within the crop area and it's not the smoothest result. You try this for yourself, guys, because I'm seeing what you're seeing right now, and on my screen it doesn't look like the smoothest result, but hopefully you can get the idea. I can drag it around in the crop area. I can resize the image within the crop area if I want to zoom in on something in particular. And I can even crop to a specific shape. Crop to shape is... Um, it was formerly the apply shape, the picture shape um, feature, so it's now under crop. If you think that, if you thought that feature went away, it's not. It's under the crop tool. I can crop to a shape. I can even crop to a specific aspect ratio. So a lot of nice tools there. There's also, in addition to your picture styles, which you've had since 2007, there's some nice improvements in terms of color and correction tools. A lot finer, a lot finer picture editing that you can do here working with color, tone, and saturation, picture corrections, all a lot more precise, brightness and contrast control and such. So check out, if you do use pictures in any of your office documents, do check those out. You're going to get this pretty much the same tools in Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. Okay, so now before we start going into program-specific things, one of the biggest improvements, one of the biggest developments in Office 2010 that I just can't tell you how excited I was when I saw this and saw that it was for real because it didn't sound like it could be, was some document management tools. The one that I'm talking about in particular is the fact that you can now actually recover content even if you never saved it. Recover unsaved documents or recover unsaved presentations, workbooks, it's named, it's named individually in each program. So, for example, so if I go to click on the file tab, which is called Backstage View, right? First of all, if you, if you don't check out Backstage View you're, and you're working in Office 2010, you're missing so much because there's really, really cool stuff here. And I know, you know, I know sometimes it sounds like I'm um, marking it. I don't, I don't mean to at all. Um, you guys, I just really love this stuff. Look at, look at there's an enormous amount of tools that you, can, um, that you can make use of here that maybe you never even thought of before, but do you want to check to see if there, might be, if there might be any potentially personal or private information in the document? You can check for a number of different, you can inspect the document for a number of different types of hidden content to see if there is content you don't want to share. You can check for accessibility, which is very handy, and that's in Word, PowerPoint, and Excel as well. Um, and each one of the tabs, I've, um, you, can, you can set these. I've, I'm not showing recent files um, because of what we're doing today. But you've got everything from, right, you've got this new integrated print environment that you've got in all three of these applications and a number of other Office apps as well that give you a lot of tools in one place. And some of the most important tools are under Save and Send, where you can go to save a, doc, a copy of a document as a PDF or look at different ways to share, like saving the documents online. Um, and I do want to mention, I'm not going to go into details here, but if you're using Office 2010, if you haven't used Office Web Apps or used SkyDrive at all, it's totally free, so you might want to check it out. Totally free to everyone. You just get a Windows Live ID. You can save to web directly from an Office application, and um, that's going to work for Office 2011 users as well. So um, you see, I've got my SkyDrive set up there. but. 
Um, you can save to the web. You get 25 gigabytes of free space. You can save and share documents on the web, photos as well. Um, and you also can then, for the documents that are saved online, your Office 2010 documents, you can edit them in Office web apps, which are free as well, so through SkyDrive. So cool stuff to check out if you haven't. Give it, give it a shot. Keep in mind, Office web apps are not a replacement for Office. They are companions. They are really for light editing, quick stuff on the go, but they might actually do more than you expect. So they might be worth checking out. Anyway, that was an aside. The reason that we're here is because in Backstage View, you might have looked at the versions group and just said, well, I don't need multiple versions. I'm not saving multiple versions of my document. I don't have to worry about that. But versions is actually something very different. If your document is saved while you're working on it, and when I say document, I mean Office document, so presentation, workbook, or Word document. If your document has been saved, you're going to see autosave versions appear here while you're working. Up to the last five autosave versions will appear periodically, and, the, and how often they appear depends on how it uh, depends on a lot of factors. How often you save, what kind of changes you're making, but you'll see autosave versions. So let's say you're working on an important report, and two hours into having it open on your screen, you think about something that you deleted an hour ago, and oh, you wish you hadn't, and you've got to reconcoct it. Well, you know what? No, you don't. You can just go back to an autosave version that would be here and open that version that was saved before you deleted that content and retrieve that content. So, um, so keep that in mind. The other thing is, as I mentioned before, well, if you're working on a document for a while and you close it without saving and then realize you need it, it's saved automatically for four days on your computer. So, and that goes again, Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. So, to get those recovered, to recover those unsaved documents, you need to be in a document that's not ever been saved. Notice that my current document has not ever been saved. You can see that on the title bar, just document two. It doesn't have a file name. And then on the Info tab, Manage Versions, Recover Unsaved Documents, that is showing me my Word documents, because it's individual by program, that I closed without saving, that Office saved a copy of in the last four days. So I made this one this morning as an example. It's not recovering. If I open it, see, it's going to give me an opportunity. It's not recovering nonsense or just pulling up text. It's pulling up my document, all my formatting, actually retrieving the whole darn thing. You can save it from there, what have you. It's also, though, a really good thing to keep in mind that, oops, Let's go ahead and just close that. To keep in mind, if you're working in a, on a public computer and you may be doing something that you never save, right? You write a letter, you print it out, you don't save it because it's private information and you don't want to save it on a public computer. You close without saving. It gets saved automatically in that backup for four days. Keep that in mind in case you want to just go into their computer and click delete all unsaved documents. That's going to clear it out so you don't have to worry about somebody seeing your content. All right, so there's tons of shared features that we could go into, but we're just not going to have time to cover everything today. So it gives you an idea, I mean, from formatting tools to tools for working with content to document management tools, there's a huge amount, really a huge amount of features that work the same or very similarly across the programs or even that have formatting or content that you can reuse across the programs. Before we jump into specific applications, the one that, one that I did want to show you, mentioned before, is slide backgrounds. So background style gallery in PowerPoint coordinates with the document theme and gives you a variety of background styles based on the effects that are set in that theme, the, the background style effects. So for example, if I apply a different theme here, you see how the background styles change, and in this case we'll have some pattern styles as well as different colors. Well, so those are part of PowerPoint-specific tools, but not completely PowerPoint-specific anymore. You had this in Excel in 2007, but it's new to Word in 2010. So let's say you wanted to coordinate your Word document even more with your theme. On the Drawing Tools Format tab, in the Shape Styles group, in Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, actually, expand 
the shape, the shape cells gallery, and at the bottom you see other theme fills. What you're actually seeing is the slide background gallery. So I can apply that and the fill of this shape, I apply that to a shape, and the fill of this shape, so I could put that in the header footer, for example, in Word, as a, and make it the full size page if I wanted it to be a page background, right? This shape now has that slide background fill. So, for example, if I apply another theme, ooh, gradients don't always look so good. That would be that bullseye you just saw in, um, in screen sharing applications. But you can see that as I point to different themes, the fill is going to change because it's applying different, it's applying fills from different, um, from different slide background gallery entries for different themes. Okay, so that said, since we're in Word right now, let's go ahead and start with a few Word features. So I'd like to talk about the fact, and we'll say goodbye to the girls for now, I'd like to talk about the fact that in Word, always feels, or it often feels, I should say, to people, particularly when they're pretty new to working with Word or don't use it very often, when you need to do a document, particularly a more complex document, get a document done that has a lot of formatting, a lot of layout to it, it can feel like there's just a million features and where do you even start and it's such a powerful program. But the thing is, the, the thing about Word is that Word actually likes things to be as simple as possible. You actually need just six features, just six features in Word, if you know them, there's not a single document you can't create. So, well, I shouldn't say not a single document, right? I should, um, I should um, say virtually not a single document. You'll have examples. Someone will come up with examples to, to belie that fact. But essentially, if you know how to use styles, tables, graphics, Section formatting, which is page layout formatting, right? Any formatting that needs a section break. Themes and dynamic content tools, which we'll take a little bit of a look at today. There's just about nothing you can't create in Word. So we're not going to have time to go into all of that today. We will have time to touch on just a few of these things, and then in the Word session, which is next month on September 30th, we'll be able to go into a good deal more detail. So I want to start off with styles. So styles in whatever program they come in, right? Style is a collection of formatting that you give a name, so you can apply it with a click wherever you need it, right? Makes it faster and easier to format a document, and makes it faster and easier to update, right? So my, my favorite example is thinking back to many years ago, many more than I should admit to, when I was actually, I was working as a temp, this was when I was in college, and working as a temp in a law firm late at night, working for an attorney and doing documents that were still, it was word perfect for DOS or something like that, and, and working on about a 200-page document. And I had to, he had every instance of the client's name throughout a 200-page document was underlined and bolded and of other things. Well, five minutes before a big meeting, this attorney said, hey, you know, all those instances that are underlined, bolded, et cetera, I need them to be you know, red and bold and no underline. And I'll be back for it in five minutes. But it was 200 pages, and it was a very long time ago. So of course it wasn't going to get done in five minutes. It was a rather daunting task. But if that had happened today, it could have been ready in five seconds and fully printed by the end of that five minutes, right? Because if you'd applied a style for that formatting, all you have to do is update the style once, and it automatically updates throughout the document. So that's the beauty of styles. Well, when you create a blank new document in Word, you may have noticed if you're using 2007 or 2010 that on the Home tab you have this styles gallery. You have a bunch of styles in this gallery. Some of them sound like the names of perfumes, right? Um, subtle emphasis and intense emphasis, um, to, to name a couple of my favorites. Um, but and I just clicked right there on the dialog launch icon to open the styles pane that will show you and give you more access to more style tools. In the styles gallery, right, you have a number of styles that 
Um, that the folks who make Word have decided are probably some good styles to give you to, as a starter that you, you may commonly use. And you've got some heading styles and the normal default style, right? If you don't apply a style, your, style, your text still has a style. It's got the normal style on it. And that's going to be your default formatting for the document. And then a handful of others. Well, a couple things to share with you that might, you know, might help that work be just a little bit easier. First of all, if you always like to use the same formatting, in your documents, but uh, it's not doesn't match what the normal is or what the default is. You could change the normal style, but you can do something even better. If you go to the Styles pane again, remember, click the Dialog Launcher in the Styles group to open the Styles pane for people who like keyboard shortcuts. Control Shift Alt S. You can actually see that if you point to the Dialog Launcher and you're using Screen Tips, it's going to show you that shortcut, so you don't have to memorize it. And that will open or close the Styles pane. Um, on the bottom of the Styles pane, you have a Manage Styles button, the furthest right of the three buttons at the bottom of that pane. And the Manage Styles dialog box does an enormous amount for you, a huge, huge amount of stuff that you can do here. Um, one of my favorite things is the Recommend tab, and we'll talk about that in a little bit for how we can customize the Styles gallery and the Styles pane. But let's go to the last tab here first, Set Defaults. You can set the default font, font size, font and paragraph formatting, and set it just for this document or for all new documents based on this template. And if you're an experienced Word user, you probably already know. But if you haven't opened a document or haven't created a document based on a specific template, then your document is based by default. And this template, the one it's referring to, is the normal, the global template, normal.m. Right. In older versions, it used to be called normal dot. Now in the new file formats, it's normal dot m, d o t m is the extension. Okay, so you don't even have to know that to do this. You can customize your font and paragraph defaults and set it to be the default for new documents or the current document. When you make those changes, when you make those changes, you're going to see them automatically update in the normal style and throughout other styles that are based on normal or based on defaults. If you ever see a style that says it's based on no style, it's based on the defaults. So when I click OK and that setting, that's automatically updated. Notice when I point to the normal style in the Styles pane, I can see that formatting and it's taken my changes for space after, for paragraph spacing, etc. Okay, so that can be a nice handy time saver. The other thing is, as mentioned, you know what? You might not want your intense emphasis and subtle emphasis in the styles gallery, but you might want other styles there, your own custom styles, right? If I, um, if I type some text and I'm going to use a favorite shortcut that I'll show you a little bit later to generate some random text, and let's say we center that text and then make it a little bit bigger and bold it and change the color. And if that's a style that I want to regularly use, well, I can go ahead and right click, point to styles. I can save the selection as a new quick style. That's one way to save a new style. If you're old school like me, Control Shift S is going to open the Apply Styles pane. It doesn't dock by default. I just dragged it to dock it. Um, it doesn't have to take up as much room as I give it. Um, and I'm just going to type a name for a new style. Still works the same. Okay. So when you create a new style, by default it's a quick style. A quick style means it's going to show up in that gallery. Well, let's say I want to add my style, but I don't want subtle emphasis. Well, I can right click. And guys, please remember right click. Remember right click. It's going to come up a lot. Galleries in Word, PowerPoint, Excel, you want to know if there's something you can do with the content in a gallery. If there are multiple options, right click an entry in that gallery. They don't all have it, but right click is Right click is a place where you're going to find some exclusive features in some cases throughout the programs, particularly in, particularly in the galleries. So I can, this is not the only place, this is not exclusive, but it is another entry point, it's another, it's a shortcut in this case. In some places, you'll find exclusive features on the right click. Here it's just a quick way to get to it. I right click a style, remove from the quick styles gallery. It's gone, but it's still here, it's in my styles pane. So I can customize this gallery. I can also add styles 
um, to the gallery. So let's say I like to use the list bullet style, which wasn't there before, right? List bullet is actually not in the gallery by default. If you're using the Styles pane, you can add it to the Quick Styles gallery. We're in the Styles pane, point to any style to see an arrow where you get lots more options and more information about that style. And you can add it to the gallery. So having styles in the gallery is great for quick access to your styles. It's great if you're creating content like templates for others to use to give your users quick access to just the styles they're going to need. It's also great because you get these See, did I leave my document up? I did, okay. So you get these style sets, these quick style sets on the home tab in the styles group, you get these quick style sets and we can see a quick preview that are going to make tremendous changes, right? They're going to apply the definitions, a different set of definitions for the styles, for the set of styles that appear in that gallery. That is a quick style set. Whatever styles appear in that gallery are part of the quick styles. And I can apply a different quick style set to change the definitions of styles throughout the document. So you can think about it that way, right? You could save your own, you can save your own custom set if you work on different types of templates, but the only difference between them is how the styles look. You can save quick style sets. At the bottom of the style set gallery, you save your own quick style sets. So you can customize this gallery. If styles don't change, it's because they're not part of the quick style set that you apply, and keep that in mind, or they have the same definition, but nice time saver there. Okay, lots more we could talk about with styles, but we'll get into that in the Word session. Let's take just a couple of quick things. You know, we're in this document here that is structured, a very highly structured table, a document. It's a, um, it is a pitch book, right, a sample pitch book. And you're going to see tables throughout this document. You can see the grid lines, the non-printing grid lines that I've turned on. Tables used to simplify the layout. You know, you can, a lot of people, I see a lot of people create documents with text boxes and shapes and they position them and, and everything is a floating object, much like it might be in Publisher or if you use a desktop publishing or layout application. Word really isn't designed that way. Word is intended for text flow, and yes, you can use floating objects, and sometimes you have to. Sometimes you have no choice, like if you want a design graphic that sits behind all of your content, right? that design graphic is going to be a floating object. But for complex layouts, all that positioning, if you've worked with them in Word, you may find, well, dealing with all those objects, it's frustrating. It's not really easy to do to position them, to keep them where you want them to be. It's not always intuitive how to select them or how to do what you need with them. Instead, when you need a really structured layout, like the pages, for example, that you're seeing here, tables are a super simple way to help you organize the page. You can't wrap text around an object in a table, but you can place content side by side. And you can even nest tables, that is put one table inside another right here. I'm going to select this table so you see what I'm talking about. I just selected the table where my insertion point is. Notice that it only selected the content what looks like is in one cell. There's a nested table inside that cell in order to give you some more flexibility. So if you've tried to use tables for layout and it's been really complicated, perhaps you tried splitting and merging cells to make it look like your layout, that will give you an absolute nightmare. The thing about tables, they're organizers, like the tray in your silverware drawer or your closet organizer. Everything has its own compartment. It's designed to be like a grid. If you break that grid, you're taking away the simplicity. So. If this is something that's interesting to you and you need to learn more about it, nested tables is what you want to look for. Be, feel free to ask questions about it. Putting one table inside another to help you create a layout really simply. If you do use nested tables and you've had problems with them with performance or stability, the really important thing is remember that Word likes things simple. Don't over nest. Don't put a bunch of layers just because it seems the easiest. You want to only put as many layers as you need. Again, if you overcomplicate that, it can become a bit overwhelming for Word, not to mention for you too, so keep that in mind. Right? The other thing, one quick tip that I want to give you for working with tables, if you insert a table, if you just insert a table by default, remember tables have styles too, whether you use them or not. So when I just inserted that table, the default style is table grid. And on the t you're going to see, you see that when you get the table, the table tools contextual tab, the table grid style by default. Well, notice that I've got these, I've got really thin lines here, even though 
my default text has space between paragraphs, right, it has space after the paragraph, that doesn't happen when I put the text in tables. Well, if that's not what you want, that's because that formatting is in the table style. The paragraph formatting that's in a table style is applied as direct formatting, so it can sometimes seem like it conflicts with your styles. Quick way to get rid of that, select the table, and quick shortcut, Control Q. Control Q clears direct paragraph formatting so it'll just reset to your style, and it'll get rid of that if you didn't want it to begin with. So if you've run into that frustration, that's an easy fix. All right, more on Word in September. In the meantime, let's take just a few minutes to talk a little bit about working with PowerPoint more easily. So if you're using PowerPoint 2007 or 2010, as most of you are using one of those versions, if you're, if you're already a PowerPoint user, you may already know that you can now customize and even create your own layouts. You can customize every layout in a PowerPoint presentation, right? On the, if we go to the Home tab, the Layout Gallery, you can see the layouts that are available by default. You can create and add your own. You can customize every one that's there. But the concept for working effectively or efficiently in a PowerPoint presentation is still the same, the basic core underlying concept. It's gotten easier because you can customize layouts, but the important thing is always to start with the master. If there's something you want to do that will apply to more than one slide, for example, if you want font sizes to be different than they are by default, if you want the bullets to be different bullets or different indents for the bullets or different paragraph spacing, any of that, if you want placeholders to be in a different position, you want to start on the master. In versions prior to 2007, a lot of us who created a lot of PowerPoint content, right, this may apply to you, we lived by the title only and blank layouts and just did our own thing because there was no flexibility, but there is now. And if you continue to do that, you're doing so much extra work and you just won't have the consistency. So on the View tab in PowerPoint, you can go to the Slide Master, or you may remember the old shortcut that hasn't changed. Hold the Shift key while you point to the Slide View shortcut or the normal View shortcut, and it's going to take you into the Master. If you are using PowerPoint 2007 or 2010, don't start editing right now. Take a look at the Slides pane on the left. You're not on the Master, you're on a layout. It will open the master layer to the layout for the slide you're actively working on. You want to scroll up to that big thumbnail at the top, that's the master. So the master is a place to make any changes that you want to apply to all of your slides. You can change, for example, the position of the master layout placeholder, um, and that is the master content placeholder, and that will change comparable, the comparable placeholders on existing layouts in kind. You can add graphics that you want to appear on every slide, such as your logo, like was asked in the assumptions questions up front, right? If I want a logo to appear on every slide, I put it on the master, and it will automatically. You can also click then onto any layout and make edits. Keep in mind, if you want, a, if you want something to apply to all of your layouts, to all your slides, do it on the master first, then customize your layouts. Quick tip, I'm working with a, a a built-in layout, like the title and content layout, I make a mess of it. Do not like what I've done, right? Let's say I thought I was, I opened this and I thought I was on the slide master. Thought I was on the slide master because title and content looks a lot like it. Made a bunch of changes that I wanted to apply everywhere. And all I did now was disconnect this layout from the master. Because then if I make changes to the master, right, it's not going to affect this layout because I've already changed this layout to be different. So what can I do? Well, if this layout is applied to slides, there's not a whole lot you can do just yet. If the layout's not applied to any slide, so let's just make this a blank layout just for a second. Create a new presentation and go into the master layer. I'm going to create, I'm just going to copy the title and content layout from a plain old blank new Office theme presentation. I could also, and then I'm going to go ahead and paste it. I'm going to, I pasted it. Notice I pasted it into the master, right? And then I can just, I can delete the existing one that was there before. And you probably want to do that before you paste so you don't mess up the names like I just did by pasting it first. You delete the one that you've messed up, which you can do after. That's why you take it off of any slides it was applied to so that you're able to delete it. 
then you can add the new one, and it's going to take on that master formatting, and you can start fresh. So you don't have to undo and redo or just live with everything or start over or live with everything being disconnected. All right. Quick tip about on-slide content. One thing that can be handy, unless that's just going to, that's just going to drive me crazy. See, messed up that name. Let's go ahead and apply that same layout. If you're working in 2010, in 2010, on a slide that has empty placeholders that take content, and you don't want to, and you don't want to use the placeholders for some reason, you want to add something in a custom spot. Keep in mind that if that placeholder is empty, and I go to insert, oh, what do you know? There's a picture of the girls again, and I'm going to go to insert a picture. On that slide, if that placeholder is empty, it's automatically going to fill that placeholder. That feature is designed to help you so that you can go to the Insert tab or you can go to the icons on the placeholder, whatever's easier. But keep in mind, if something seems to happen or your layout seems to change in an undesired way, that might be the thing. If there is an empty placeholder, it's going to get filled. All right. One other thing that I want to talk about, there's so many, there's so many cool features in PowerPoint that are new in this version. In 2010 and for the Mac folks out there in 2011 as well, um, many of the same features, but we don't have time for all of those. That will be the PowerPoint session in October. But one thing that I do want to talk about is multimedia because that is just huge. So I'm going to go ahead and insert a video here. And what's really cool about this video that I have just inserted, it is embedded. It is not linked. I don't have to worry about packaging files. I don't have to worry about what folder that video file is in when I need to share this presentation with other people. It is embedded. It's in my presentation. It will travel with my presentation just like my smart art and my charts and my text. Just exactly the same. It is part of the presentation now. You also have really great video, some just basic, simple, easy to use, but really cool video editing tools. You can trim your videos just by dragging the start and ends, right, or changing the start and end times. You can, uh, you have a very simple, very intuitive tool to work for, with for trimming. You can set fades for the beginning and end to fade in and out. This is a cool thing that we're not going to have time to go into how to do it, but I want to make sure to mention. You can bookmark any point in a video or audio clip, and that can let you go, you know, just quickly go right to the um, right to that um, bookmark place when you're when you're doing playback in your slideshow. But what it also does is it works with a cool animation feature called triggers. On the animations tab you see triggers. And if you have bookmarks, we don't right now, but you see on bookmark is available in that menu. If there are bookmarks, they'll automatically become available. You can trigger animation to start at a bookmark point. So what does that mean? That means that I can actually add captions in my video. So I could have something, I could have an arrow if I want to point to something on the slide pop out at the right time. I could have a caption, right text that comes up when something specifically happens or shape or any other object that, that comes up, right? I animate that object on the slide and I set it to be triggered when I reach that bookmark in the video. It's very cool, very easy to set up and use, too. Um, Mac users out there, you can't set these up. You don't have the features in Office for Mac to um, add bookmarks or triggers, but they will play back if you're playing a presentation that has them. So really cool features for video editing and playback. And a couple of things to keep in mind about embedded video. One is, oh, notice. Mentioned earlier, if the presentation's been saved before, and if a file document presentation or workbook's been saved before, you're going to get those autosave versions. Um, you can see some of those right here in PowerPoint, for example. So I could click on an earlier one to see an earlier version before I made some changes. Notice here on the info tab at the top, I've got this media size and performance, that compressed media options. The option to compress my media if my files get big, because right with embedded video, it can get huge, really unmanageable. So you want to keep an eye on that size. 
This video is a Windows Media video. If it was a QuickTime video, for example, which is now supported in Office in PowerPoint for Windows, or a number of other formats that are now supported, some of those do need codecs. If you need to learn about working with other formats, ask that question, and I will um, get you some resources for that. But if it was another format, you'd see another option here on the Info tab to optimize media. The optimized media will convert the copy that's in the presentation. It won't affect your original file. It will convert the copy that's in the presentation to a Windows Media format. So these tools to help you manage the media, they only appear if they're applicable to the media in your presentation. So if you go to the Info tab and don't see them, you, there's nothing wrong with your copy of Office 2010. You're not missing anything. I didn't make it up. Um, they're just, it doesn't apply to your particular presentation. Uh, while we're talking about video, probably my favorite favorite um, of the new features for sharing content, create a video in PowerPoint 2010. It works in the background while you're working. It will save totally full fidelity video of your slideshow. So if you've created slide na narration, animations, timings, etc., it's going to um, it's going to create it's going to use all the new cool animations and um, and uh, transitions, all of your media playback as long as it's Windows Media format. So you'll want to use that optimized compatibility before creating your video. So you don't have to worry about if somebody has PowerPoint or they're using the PowerPoint viewer or what have you, whatever program they have, wherever they have, even if they want to play back that presentation with all its guts and glory on their iPod while they're traveling, you can send them a video of it and they'll have the whole thing in perfect, in perfect um, format. Okay. Lots more to talk about about PowerPoint, but boy, I am I am gonna sell gonna sell the Excel users a little bit short here. I don't get my act together. I'm I'm going to in any case, but we're on a little bit over there. And um, so we're going to talk just really quickly about a few tips for working in Excel. All right, so I've got this bland little bit of this range of data in Excel, and I want to talk about just a few of my favorite features. Another feature that was introduced in 2007, um, and um, here, of course, we're in 2010, is Excel tables. So Excel tables are the evolution of what used to be called um, lists in Excel, the XML lists, if you worked with them in an earlier version. A lot more powerful, a lot easier to use. And if you used earlier versions of Excel and never heard of those, not surprising. But tables you're going to want to. So if I click anywhere in this region, format as a table, and click OK, it's going to apply formatting. Notice I've got the Table Tools Design tab. It's going to come up on your screen in a second if it's not already. I've got table styles. They have nothing to do with Word table styles, totally separate. It's important to keep in mind, Word, PowerPoint, and Excel all have table styles. They're totally unrelated. But in Excel, like in Word, you can create your own. Again, new table style here. You get other options like set as default. That's, an ex that's exclusive there, right? On the right click, remember that right click. And you can format many different things. Notice that you've got the banded rows. You get banded columns. You can add a total row, which you can um, customize, which has additional functionality as well. But tables aren't just pretty. Tables aren't just to help your formatting, which coordinates with your theme by default, for, um, incidentally. You get these auto filters. So you could apply all those things. It does a lot of that automatically for you. But if you, uh, when you're working with tables, you also get a lot of really cool functionality, such as calculated columns. Like if I go to the column to the right of my table and I create a little formula there, it automatically adds a column and adds that formula to the entire column. Also, if you take a look at the formula it created, notice that the references are to parts of the table. Those are called structured references. They make it a lot easier and more dynamic to work with data because if that table changes, right, you add data to it, the, the size of the table changes, it's still going to apply to the whole region, to the whole part. Similarly, if a table is a data source, like for a chart or for a pivot table, then that data is going to automatically recognize that data source when you refresh. It's going to automatically recognize the whole table, right? When you hit, when you increase or change the size of that table, it will make it a lot easier to update your data. So, lots of cool stuff about working with tables. They can really help tremendously. Notice how they work automatically with um, with pivot tables as well, and um, and just really powerful data tool, but also pretty nice um, for helping you simply. You know, um, simplify formatting your worksheets. Now, charts 
um, very briefly, charts, as we um, mentioned earlier, are available natively in PowerPoint and in Word as well, Excel charts. I'm going to just press F11, the shortcut here, to create a new, a new instance of my default chart based on the active data. Notice I was clicked into Arrange. This would be for true for Arrange um, as well as for a table, but I was clicked into that table, so I didn't have to select the data range. It just automatically used the whole table to get my chart. It charts, the charting engine was recreated in a brand new, brand new charting engine in 2007, and um, that now is part of the Office Graphics Engine. And so that means that you can format chart elements as flexibly and as easily and to coordinate with shapes, graphics like SmartArt graphics, the graphics in your document, and they automatically coordinate with themes. There's a lot that we can take a look at about charts, and we will in, I, think it's, uh, I believe it's November when we look specifically at Excel in the session. But in the meantime, just a quick note, chart styles, remember chart styles do coordinate with your active document theme. They don't have live preview like most of the theme formatting does, meaning I can point to gallery entries. It's not going to automatically update. But let's say I have a chart style applied, and I do a bunch of customization. This was a pet peeve for me for a really long time. Now, I'm not sure why I'd want to make some of the changes I'm making right now, but notice that if I change that, I change the font size, I change the, I, the font color, and now if I decide, oh, you know what, I really wanted this chart to be blue, well, that's going to all get blown away, right? I click to apply another chart style, now I have to redo however many customizations I have. Let's undo that. Remember your right click, folks? Right click on the blue style, apply and maintain formatting. It applies the style without stripping your customizations. Cool tip, right? Um, that one was actually shown to, um, shown to me last year, I think, by one of the folks who, um, who makes these lovely charts, who creates these, this application. So that was a fun one for me to learn. Okay, I do want to talk about pivot tables, but you know what? We're really ready to come out of the share now, and I know to talk about pivot tables today. If you wanted more info on pivot tables, I'm going to ask you to ask me. We're just, we're out of time. I don't want to, I don't want to not leave time for questions. Um, so I am going to stop sharing for now. We will get a chance to go into pivot tables in the Excel session. I can also give you additional resources about them, and we'll talk about that. Um, hi. Um, sorry about that, folks. Oh, she's doing can you hear me? <laughs> Am I back? You're back. Yes, I apologize. There was a very brief power search which <laughs> cut off my phone. Um, I apologize. At least it didn't cut off the Internet connection. I'm very sorry for that. So, um, so here we are, and I know that cost us a couple of minutes. I do apologize for that, folks. So you know what? I'm going to skip the summary recap. Um, we just went through a whole bunch of stuff. You guys don't need me to tell you what we just went through. Well, yes, it would be nice. But I'm going to skip that because I'd instead like to give you some additional resources and use the time to answer some of your questions as well. Um, and if you'd like to recap, Remember again that this is going to be um, that the session is recorded, so you can go back and revisit it. I'm also going to do a little bit of a recap, which I will get posted over this weekend on my blog, and that is the first link that you can see on this resource slide, um, Arrowway.net. It is just about the most neglected blog there is. I will completely admit that, but I do post there about upcoming publications and webcast events. There's a lot of tips. You can find links to articles and publications. You can find more info about my books there, and you can also use a link to send me a question there. So please do feel free to use that if you don't get your question answered today or if questions come up later. Maybe you're working in a program and you run into something that you think is related to a tip that we talked about today and just don't remember and want some help or guidance on it. Do feel free to send me your questions there and um, or to ask me for additional follow-up resources. So just a few other links here. A couple other things that I did want to tell you about, of course, and Yas may have already told you this, but you can go to sign up for any of the other webcasts. Um, mine and all of the other really, really cool webcasts, lots of really cool webcasts that O'Reilly does um, on a lot of different topics. Um, if you are an Office 2010 user or you're considering it, or regardless of what version of Office you use, office.com has, if you haven't checked it out, you're really missing out on just a lot of free content. There's product information if you want to learn about the products, but there's also tools. There's tons of templates. You know, and a template is just a jumping off point. You don't have to use it as it is, but 
it might be able to give you ideas. It might help you learn how to do stuff. Um, very cool stuff. Templates, um, clip art, all sorts of cool things. Um, it looks like they, you've lost the additional resources slide. So if you didn't see them all, because um, it's taking you, it looks like it's taking you out to the webcast survey since I'm running a little bit behind here. If you'd like those other links, they're going to be posted in that follow-up link on my blog. Again, that's arroway.net, A-R-O-U-E-T.net. And among them is where to get the Office 2010 product guides. If you're looking, if you're not a user of, of Office 2010 yet, or you are, and you want to see if there's features you're missing, you can learn about all the new features there, see where to find them, compare the versions. Um, and you can also find some other tools there as well. There's also some follow-up resources for folks who are users of Office for Mac as well. So do follow up with me and check out the blog after this weekend for those resources as well. So now, without further ado, I think what I'm going to do since I'm going to take a quick look at the Q&A and see if there are questions that I should answer before everyone runs away. If you have to leave and you don't get your question answered, yeah, actually, um, feel Stephanie, free to follow I'm up with me. Hi there. We're going a bit long, and folks are starting to drop off. And I made an announcement to them that we are going to put your website URL in the group chat, and they can contact you there with the questions. And we are going to download the questions and send them to you. So I apologize for that, but we're going a bit long. Folks are starting to drop off, and we do appreciate the hour they have spent with us. You were fantastic, Stephanie. We are very impressed with all the wonderful information that you have shared with us today, and I am sure our audience has benefited greatly from that. We'd like to remind them again that your next webcast will be on Friday, September 30th for creating Better Word 2010 documents, and we hope to see them there. Thank you again.